beneath that heaven moon And something whispered someday soon We'll kiss There Tomorrow was another day The morning found me miles away beams the skies above We call it what's left of our love There's one thing that I'm certain of Return, Return. I, I will, will to my Brazil Ah, oh, crap, I gotta get a drink Hold on Dude, you know what I love about that song <clears throat> is that uh, the guy the guy who uh, performed it, that, by the way, was the Asylum Street Spankers, from Austin, Texas, the band that links me and one Ernie Klein at the Electric Lounge. And it always makes me think of uh, the movie Brazil, which if you haven't seen, you totally should. It's amazing. And uh, there we go. Um, and uh, I found out that uh, Olivier, the guy who does vocals and lead guitar on that, the reason he wanted to put it on the album was because it made him think of the... He loved the movie. The movie is so bizarre, man. It's amazing. Gigaloop disliked? You disliked Brazil? The bureaucratic nightmare? So good, man. Oh, my God. All right, let me get uh, the rest of the gang all fired up in here. Let me do Andrew Main. Charm. Oh, you know what? There were actually three versions. This is important. There were three versions of Brazil. One of them is a horrific bastardization of what the guy actually wanted. There was the compromise version that came out. There was the director's cut, which was amazing. Uh, and then there's the utterly shitty... The whole point of the movie was the opposite of what it was supposed to be. It actually, uh, it actually, what was great about, hey, let me turn this down. Uh, Terry Gilliam uh, was was banking on people having seen 1984, so it shouldn't look like a 1984 ripoff. It should look like something riffing within the tropes established by 1984. It's sort of meta above it. You need to have seen 1984 to even understand the game that they were playing with Brazil. At least that's the way I read it. That's what I loved about it. I'm gonna call a bunch of people. I probably look really thoughtful whenever I look up at the uh, screens up here. I'm, I'm not kidding you guys. I would kill for a 4K display to replace all of this. That would be amazing. Brian, I'm, I'm flattered that you want to see me on a 4K display. Uh, you know what? I was going to say specifically just your nipples, but I mean, if, if, if the rest of you comes along for the ride, that's okay by me. How you doing, Andrew Main? I'm good. Yoshi Oni in the chat room says I should 
uh, says Southeast Asia needs you. Yoshioni, are you from the Southeast? Is that where you're? Southeast Asia? Did you call uh, Justin? Yeah, I did. Um, neither of you guys, it just says starting video for both of you. All right, yeah, I was trying to hang up on him and it was holding, so maybe it'll work now. All right. Uh, both of you guys, I'm seeing loop loops. MTL Hazy wants to know if 1984 is worth seeing if he's already read the book. Oh my God, yes, it is. It was fantastic filmmaking. What did you think of the movie, the 1984 movie of 1984? Me? Um, I think I just watched it like a year or so ago. I enjoyed it. Um, the scene that makes it for me is, if you remember in the book, he describes um, encountering this... Uh, uh, this prostitute who's beautiful at first and then hideous as you got to see her like they nailed that scene and of course yeah. John Hurt gets hurt yeah I like that I liked uh, I liked you know the other dystopian one was the uh, you know when Truffaut did Fahrenheit I never saw Fahrenheit hang on let me let me try hanging up and calling you back or, or huh. what, you what, know, what do I hang <laughs> What do I hand get to doctor? We'll get him back on. Which means that I've got time to squeeze in one more. Hello? Well, hello, sir. Hello. Bring it back. There we go. Justin Robert Young. What is up? You, sir. Uh, I, I have the distinct feeling that I'm hearing a room mic and not your real face. Let me investigate your hypothesis. You got it, sir. Nope. You were totally wrong. <laughs> As we hear your voice change and no longer nope, hear the keyboard that clicking. was in your head. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Did you see the movie Brazil? Uh... I have, yes, but not in a very long time. It's way, not since like high school. way good. I'll call Andrew Main back. Justin Robert Young, we can either have it out now on the Weird Things podcast or we can have it out uh, tomorrow on an NSFW, but we're going to have it out over Spider-Man, the amazing Spider-Man. Uh, then I'd rather have it out here where it's two against one. Okay. Because I can't decide which is well, I mean, actually, we'll we'll discuss it. But I can't decide which was less true that it was the best of that, the that it was the best of the Spider-Man movies, or that it was the Batman Begins of Spider-Man movies. Because they're both patently wrong, and I can't decide which is less. You're true. ridiculous if you think number one. The first one is so is like if you don't think it's the best of the Spider-Man movies, then I have to recalibrate your taste as a human. Uh, the, the Batman Begins one, I think it really depends on what you think about Batman Begins. I mean, I can't plug in. I, I think that there are objective ways that you can say that they wanted to do similar things and it was far more like that. But I, we can get into all this. All right. I have a whole hypothesis and my ability to predict who likes it and who doesn't is based upon one one little formula that I picked up and how people discuss other other films. All right. Well, here, I got, uh, can you guys position your cameras so we're all? All right, I'm going to go be right back, but this will be where I'll be at. All right. Yeah, that works. I'm very glad you saw it, though, so we could talk about it. Yeah, no, I was way excited. Uh, I ended up spending like $120 to see it last night. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because like, um, uh, because... I had to cajole other people like other people just wanted to get together to say hi. But I but with my plans, I was like, you know, it'd be fun is if I took you guys to go see the Spider-Man at the draft house. And then, uh, ah. you know, so that alone, like ka-ching, 44 bucks and then uh, and then, you know, picking up the meal and everything. But it's like, I mean, I was glad to have the experience of going seeing the movie. But uh, but I, I sincerely think you're I. I have theories as to what you, why you think what you think. Uh, I am guessing these theories don't involve me being 
a at an accurate cultural arbiter with excellent taste in films? <laughs> no. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about it. I feel like it's going to be a challenge to not talk about it with that with that prelude with your. I feel like you've you've already shot your warning shot, and then you're like, "Well, we hey, listen, we can discuss it now, or we can discuss it later." About how you're a complete idiot. <laughs> I no, and and that's just it. Is I'm not saying you're a complete idiot. Uh, you could be a hundred percent. Look, um, Einstein was way a hundred percent wrong about uh, when he said uh, whatever the things that he said that were wrong. <laughs> but he was still smart and a good guy. It was right about other things. Ex excellent point, right? <laughs> I, I was about to. I was. I, I realized that I was painting myself into a corner in which I needed to quote Einstein and remember what things he was wrong about. There was a. Uh, uh, it was quantum theory. He was. He was way wrong about. You know where he said it was God. actually uh, the five second rule that he was wearing. <laughs> yeah. He had initially posited that it was the three second rule. No, but he was wrong. He was, was clearly five, five seconds. seconds. It was five seconds. All right. Do you want me to try to shoot this out on the Google Plus just to see if it gets out there? And then if it fails, like meanwhile we'll embed the Justin thing. But meanwhile I'll try to put it out on the Google Plus. Well, um, yeah, I, I just need to know what is the best embed, what I need to put on the website. Definitely embed the, uh, oops, the Houston TV. Uh, yeah. Five, seven, nine. Uh, Brian, this will be my position. Your your permanent position, your your position on all the issues. Yes. <laughs> and I can't bring you down any farther. Are we? Uh, we're still not live, right? Oh no no no! We've been live. All right. I was just saying that uh, I'm going to try to. Um, there, I'm going to I'm going to see if I could also go live on this other shenanigan. Uh, I'm going to do Hangouts. Hangouts on air. I'm going to do all the click through of the 18 billion things that they have to do. So crazy. Start a Hangout. By the way, I saw Spider-Man again last night. Why? Because uh, there were there were questions that you still had that needed to be answered. That no, weren't... because I wanted to see it in IMAX. You're there so, was so unfulfilled from the first time. <laughs> right. There was so there was such again. depth to, to the. Some the you're like you're like why does the lizard man want his arm back? And you had to I'll go back a what. second time. I, asked, I did. I picked up. I picked up a few <laughs> other things. I really. You're do like enjoy why them. is his camera from the 1970s? <laughs> Have you met a photographer in Queens? Like I, I have a photographer in Queens in my family. Oh, is that, that the card you're playing? Is camera. is the photographers I know they in Queens? It. This is this is the 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 smackdown. It's not a smackdown. I'm just oh, saying that literally we're, my we're cousin up the widest, uh, widest has camera, Kickstarter that I, that I promoted about using filmed. an old I camera to, that, but to I'm not shoot shit in um, wherever Georgia. Like that's like a thing in like photographer in the photographer communities using. You know what would have been rad is if they had said that in the movie. But instead, just had this artifact complete with punch out 1970s property of Peter Parker on the back. Do you, do you you not know why? I mean, did does everything have to be spoon fed to you? What do you mean? I I just think that you, you saw it. I'm like, okay, I get it. And then I'm like, move right along. I'm glad they didn't stop the movie to be, hey, you know, this is his dad's camera. Um, no, maybe they should have said that because why? <laughs> well, no, 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 because because the question's not like whether the cameras is dead. Well, or not. all right, let's the, save this. For all right, the, all right, all right. Save the juice. All right. Prime mm. juice. Seven, nine, twelve. Hang out. Here we are, hanging out completely alone. I'm gonna click start the broadcast, and it's gonna say, bro. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Cancel, cancel, cancel. Uh, yes. Vid Blaster VVD. And theoretically, we should be good. I don't know.
All right, we'll see. I'm going to start it. Now, theoretically, we should be. Can anyone verify in the chat room? I'm going to click over to the chat room. Can anyone verify whether or not um, we're moving in you the... You like it, the juice. The juice whether or not, good, whether no? or not we like the juice. He likes it, the juice. So the, the question is, Justin TV is moving, obviously, right? So here we are doing this thing. And uh, the it looks good on the on the public hangout. All right. Well, then we're good. Done and done and done. All right. Ooh. I'll retweet. I'll retweet that. All right. Retweeting. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Oh my gosh, gentlemen, I'm so ready. Oh wait, let me uh, open up just this thing to record the audio, and then we'll be good. Next week, I'll be recording from Los Angeles. Are you? Did you, uh, hello, test, one, two, three. Let me hear, uh, Andrew first. Hello, test, three, two, one. Oh, uh -huh. Justin? Ah, uh, test, three, two, five, six, seven. Delta Echo Foxtrot. All right, I think we're ready to go, gentlemen. All right. <clears throat> I guess I got to start something, all right? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hey! What's going on, everybody? Are you going to make us smell your finger and ask us what it smells like? Wow! That was quite a leap. <laughs> what? Where were you today, Justin? Oh. Well, I, I don't want to lead off with that. I, I mean, oh, my no, name isn't... Late. Oh, Justin, uh, I was hanging out at Pixar today young. It's it's lead. It's lead. Let's rock it. Go. Well, yeah. I mean, do we do Brian? Do we introduce that? No, no I, I don't, don't exist. It's 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 all of it's all about Justin. Dude, the uh, cars really talk. Yeah, That's so I, I went to know. Pixar. I did a I did a tour all of right, Pixar. So yeah, here's Brian. Brushwood. Brian, tell me what you did today. Uh, dude, I woke up, I rode my bicycle, which didn't talk. I met an old man, which didn't make a house that floated but away. The and, bicycle uh, had one wheel, right? And I saw a fish that didn't that didn't look for his son. So apparently, my whole life sucks. Bicycle wasn't like one wheel. Like no, no, no. It's nothing interesting in my life has happened. Hmm. Justin, uh, I had Brave spoiled for me by one of the animators of Brave. Oh, did they t did they tell you that? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. It's gonna think of any number of hateful things to say about the movie Brave, <laughs> but I just did you see it? Kids. I no. didn't see any. The, the, the kids saw it, and Bonnie walked out, and she's like, "What is it with Disney where they can't have a movie with a female lead that's not about what boyfriend they can or can't have? Why is every single Disney movie like if anybody could have made a movie with a female lead where it wasn't about what what her boyfriend was or was not going to be, it would have been Pixar, but instead they made a whole movie about what her boyfriend was going to be. She was really bummed out about that." Okay. So, um, yeah, we just passed uh, yesterday. You know what it was the anniversary of, gentlemen? Um, Pop Rocks. <laughs> I'm gonna possibly. Say the possibly could have been. Paparazzi. Could have been when we got the Pop Rocks technology, if you know Pop, what I mean. Popping and locking. <laughs> It's the anniversary of the pop and lock. Uh, I, I, am a, I, I, I give up. What is it? 65 years ago in a town whose other famous product is Miss Demi Moore, an incident occurred, a controversial incident. The Tunguska Blast. Yes. <laughs> in this town in New Mexico, Siberia. <laughs> something like... 30 plus years after the Tunguska blast. Right. Well, it was the 30th anniversary of the Tunguska blast. We're celebrating the anniversary of that celebration. Yes. Something crashed in the New Mexico desert. Roswell. No, Roswell was already there. Something crashed in the I, desert I, outside of Roswell. I, I Maybe thought, a UFO or flying saucer. Oh, so, so the city did not. Fit. No, I, no, I, Brian. See, that's way Wrong I, again. See, I saw Independence Day and I thought that's how the city got there. Yeah. Was well, like it just the the UFO crashed and then the the sediment and 
that formed along with the heat and the pressure into various condos. Actually, I thought it was more like the Superman Fortress of Solitude thing where it was like a crystal crashed and it sort of just crystallized and formed the town of, of Roswell, complete with the tchotchkes and the shops. <laughs> True. It was actually an alien plan to build a tourist trap. <laughs> Which makes about as much sense as Lex Luthor doing it. <laughs> So it was 65 years ago today that the mystery began with these conflicting newspaper reports saying flying saucer, then that was changed and whatnot back and forth. And uh, conventional wisdom says that it was Project Mogul, which was a train of balloons which was used to listen to high atmospheric sounds to see if they could listen to the detonations of atomic bombs in Russia and other places. Of course, other people say, no, aliens, aliens, it's aliens. Well, and there's always been the part of the evidence oft cited is is the metal, right? That right. there was a, a a metal that was like instantly repairing. Well, Imagine a thin fabric like metal that you could crumple up and then it could unfold itself, wrinkle free. Well, I mean, what you're of course referring to is the fact that mylar was a well, substance. No, Brian, I'm talking about a space metal from <laughs> space. Okay, my mylar was not commonly seen around this time. It was a very surprising material. Even if they had heard of it, they hadn't gotten their hands on it. Most most people in small town of Roswell would not have seen mylar by that time. And so it makes sense that it's like, you know, you can factually state something crashed. I don't know what it is. It was saucer-like. It had a metal-like substance, the likes of which I've never seen. It had properties of no metal that I'd ever seen before. When you crumpled it, it would unfold itself, and it, you could actually tear it by hand. It was, it was unlike any metal I'd ever seen. All of that would be factually accurate, but when you hear somebody else say that, it could sound like crazy magic alien sauce. How do we know that the Mylar industry did not come from space and this was some <laughs> big little underground is, guerrilla campaign by aliens to get us and, excited and about Mylar? Mylar. <laughs> this, is the, uh, this is the Men in Black defense, right? Where it's like, that's where we got Velcro and the CD was from the aliens. Yes. Take off their uniforms. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Let's check their wallets for let's check their wallets for some ID. <laughs> <laughs> this is the it was a fascinating thing device. Ever. The likes of which I've Wait. never seen. Look at the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Our minds are blown. Nice. <laughs> so wow, so it's been that long. I mean, and where was UFO lore pre Roswell? Like, is this like the is it just the most famous because it was so high profile was that around or, or was it was it just right for because uh, you, you see that there's been mysterious phenomenon throughout history but what we blame no, the hasn't. mysterious phenomenon on it depends on what you know what's fashionable for example you know crop circles if they happened in the 18 or in the 1600s they would have said the satan made them but because right now you know or 20 years ago aliens were more in vogue than anything mysterious was probably Aliens, uh, do you think it was a case where it was the right kind of story right before the first uh, big UFO flap of well, the 20th yeah, I mean, century? You had, you had the, uh, the term, the Kenneth Arnold sighting was 1947. You had flying saucer type things, you know, when you had all these sort of science fiction, like the first like amazing sort of tales magazines come out. There was the airship hysteria 30, 40 years, you know, 40 years, 50 years prior, you know, you know, 60 years prior. It's part of what I braced, you know, my... Martian Emperor book on was the airship hysteria, plug plug. Um, but uh, so you had you had that going on before sort of these strange objects. But yeah, 1947. I think like that was the. I'm gonna like just pull up the Kenneth Arnold uh, flying saucer sighting. Well, and so and if if I understand it correctly, and you can correct me on this because I know you know more than me on everything. But uh, the it seems like every big flap of UFO sightings is highly correlated with some event that causes normal people to go out and look at the sky for the first time in a long time. For example, just after Sputnik was announced, for the first time, a bunch of people went outside and looked up to see if they could see Sputnik. And they didn't see Sputnik, but they saw a whole bunch of crap that they'd never seen before. So you get this 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 flurry of UFOs, and it becomes very flash, fashionable. You know, they, people fall for all of the the same visual phenomenon that they... Uh, that they that they've never thought about before, like uh, the context of the trees making it appear as though Jupiter is dancing up and down and left and right and so on. Yeah, I mean there there can be correlations to that I, I sometimes think that skeptics tend to over, 
you know, analyze those explanations sometimes, though. You know, oh, the chupacabra because the movie Species came out. Well, you know, Puerto Rico's got a bunch of iguanas that look a lot like a chupacabra. So, you know, I, 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 I have my own thoughts on that. But so you had 19, 1947, just a few weeks prior, was when Kenneth Arnold claimed to see nine unusual flying objects. So you had what would have been a minor event, you know, at that point where this pilot says he saw these flying discs, the flying saucer thing gets quoted. A couple weeks later, you get Roswell. Ruth. And so, yeah, quote, you know, unquote, the public's imagination is captured. Yeah, and it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know if it's like weird events like Roswell happen periodically all the time, but the ones that become famous are the ones where the public is ripe and excited to to explode or something into a, into a land. You know, I mean, yeah, the media. sure, sure. Uh, or, or, or if it's the kind of thing where, um, I mean, I don't know what the alternative would be. I guess it would be the kind of thing where uh, maybe, I, I can't imagine that the other thing would lead to the other. Like, hysteria wouldn't lead to a balloon crashing. I mean, I think also, like, they're, they're, to Andrew's point about the media, I mean, at that point, the idea of a story going national, I mean, now our ideas of what a national or international story is, is, is you know, paper thin compared to what it took for something to nationally be reported and there be any sort of collective national consciousness on an event. And this was certainly one of those that seemed to capture the uh, attention enough and that enough singular gatekeepers thought to kind of transmit this to their their readership. And that's why I think it has this permanence. All right. So there you go. 65 years ago today. You're welcome, Roswell. Absolutely. Now, I'll tell you what. Let me go ahead and say that this episode of the Weird Things Podcast is brought to you by uh, Studio Drown Tales Incorporated. That is D-R-O-W-T-A-L-E-S. They'd like to toss in their own mythos into our Pegasus versus Unicorn debate from last week uh, with toes. You can't beat that. Check out their fantasy graphic novel over at drowtales.com, D-R-O-W-T-A-L-E-S.com. It's free, and uh, they want to let everybody who listens to this podcast know to head on over there right now. Again, that is D-R-O-W-T-A-L-E-S.com who brought you this episode with one of our three sponsored spots that happened every single week. Go head on over to weirdthings.com slash sponsor to get your spot read right here, all up in the podcast. Can I, can I just say, uh, on a, as a footnote to the Pegasus versus Unicorn debate, uh, this is how petty I am, is this afternoon I was thinking about how the two of you mocked me relentlessly for, uh, for, for being on the side of air superiority. So I actually made a poll on my Google+. Plus and so I put, uh, who would win in a fight, a Pegasus or a unicorn? Of mouth breathers that follow Brian Brushwood. Uh, what? Okay, well, first of all, half them, <laughs> like the vast majority of these people have never listened to me on the Weird Things podcast. But they follow you. Go ahead, continue. Well, okay, well, there is that. Uh, maybe like minds. Like minds, Andrew Main. But uh, 25 to 11 right now, it's Pegasus versus unicorn. So, or maybe well, I may Look at what you... <laughs> <laughs> have the descriptions there, of course. What are you talking about? You have superior in one of the descriptions. <laughs> well, and I also made it first. Did you notice that? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and your, and it has, it has a horn, not your double-bladed can cut you any angle when it's attacking a centaur. Well, I, I, let me point out that it was you guys that, that, that struck down my idea that there could be anything sharp about a unicorn's horn. I was trying to sell it on having sharp edges like a drill bit, and you guys are like, no, you're stupid about that as well. It's a dumb... Somebody called, My favorite comment was somebody who said, unicorn's just a goat, but with one less horn. <laughs> How's a goat going to beat air a Pegasus? <laughs> well, but it's you, not a goat. Pegasus is just a chicken with, like, a mane. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> which would, maybe that's how I should have phrased it, is which would win in a fight, a goat with one horn or a chicken with a mane? <laughs> and by the way, I love how, like, whenever me and Andrew agree on something against Brian, it's relentlessly mocked. Nothing but endlessly, just the barbs that were that were tossed at me. I'm, Jesus Christ did not have to suffer such torment. Fair enough. <laughs> I realized that in doing that, I was just now relentlessly. Yeah, I, 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 
the uh, the. Well, no, the... I relented. It was not relentless. <laughs> I, I, all right, I all right, all right, all right, all right, gentlemen. All right, I need Spiro and Fudge. No, we're on the case, boss. Great. Gentlemen, we've got a murder. We think. Awesome. I mean, uh, all right. I'm sorry, boss. Yes, we're here for you. Yeah, you seemed a little bit excited about that. Uh, listen, boss, we uh, we're career minded individuals, and Why if you don't mind, why is your hand in your pocket? Um, because I think I might be getting a, a call. Party Rock is in the house. Did I, all right. <laughs> Hello. Sorry, I'm talking to the chief. Click. Go ahead. Step yes. Step inside saying. the crime scene. What are we seeing here? What do we got? See, Where's the Vic? There's a dead possum in the middle of the floor. Done. Is this a pet? <laughs> Did you say snakes? Done. It's a snake. <laughs> and now, sitting on the coffee table, is a jar of poison. <laughs> Uh, did the possum drink the poison? How much of the poison? Do me a favor. Uh, the fudge. Do me a favor. Drink that poison. See if no, it's really poison. No, I'm not going to drink the poison. Although I'm pretty sure that did the possum drink the poison is a Willie Nelson song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, man. Uh, how full is this poison bottle? Uh, it's empty. Oh, but it's clearly labeled poison? It says poison on it. Okay, but is there any other words, anything that maybe, maybe you know, poison slash baking sugar, something that, like, might have been accidentally used for something else? No, the possum couldn't read. It really wouldn't make a difference. Okay, all right, all right. No, there's no is dead... the possum wearing reading glasses? <laughs> no. There's no There's no dead people, though, right? No. No dead people reanimated as this living... This is like a shanty condominium. Where are we sure. looking at? Is it a meth lab? No. You sure? That's next door. I'm gonna, I'm, you know what? I'm gonna go check out the meth lab. You take over, Fudge. All right. Well, Spiro, Jesus, uh, and and also next time, please come in your regular uniform and not your uh, buttocks shaping <laughs> compression. Uh, listen, pants. okay. I'm sorry. I thought I put you in charge of the investigation, not the assassination of my wardrobe. Do you mind I'm getting sorry. focused I'm sorry. on the? I facts? was relentlessly mocking your compression. Yes, pants. exactly. Jesus Christ Himself did not have to suffer such relentless mocking. <laughs> go ahead. All right, well, I think, obviously, this possum drank the poison. Bada bing, bada boom. We have a possum poison uh, probability. I'm back. This. I'm back. Listen, I just mess, met with the possum posse, friends of the show, uh, <laughs> and they were uh, they were saying there's probably more to the story because Andrew Maine never lays out a scenario this simple. So so let me ask uh, let me ask the chief again. Uh, chief, are there any other animals? Any other? Is there any food? Why would the possum even be in here? Well, gentlemen, uh, maybe that's a very biased question to ask the possum why he's living in his own house. And doesn't I'm, have roommates? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hold on. No, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the fudge. Don't you understand? Yeah. Possums don't have house. This is this is an unusual <laughs> case. <laughs> Possums don't have house. <laughs> Possum ain't got no house. How 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 possum gonna sit in his Mr. own house? Mr. Fudge, Mr. Fudge, possum have no house. Well, gentlemen, it's a trick question. Oh wait, uh, how surprising, Chief. That's so so unlike you to give Spiro into the fudge. You should have realized when he walked in there something was afoot. <laughs> You're right. We really should have. Well, Apparently, I mean, possums are like uh, damn near hard to poison. What? Possums have a special protein, the American opossum produces a protein called lethal toxic neutralizing factor. It does pretty much what it does. You think it does this according to IO9, seeks out potentially deadly poisons and neutralizes them. They're almost all but immune to the venom of poisonous snakes, okay? And they've used this, they've injected rats with this LTNF and then pumped them full of otherwise lethal dose of venom, of venom from cobras, Australian taipans, rattlesnakes, scorpions. And then they've even tried to kill them with ricin. Oh my God. Wow. So, so we're talking about uh, essentially possums being a, a, a limitless source of, of antivenom. Botulism to didn't everything. work either. To botulism? Now, there are special poisons to kill possums. Don't worry. You could <laughs> kill them. If one of you had the, you know, the guts to actually to ask me what kind of poison it was. What kind of poison was that? Uh, it was not a possum-killing poison. It was a okay. regular it was regular poison. They needed yeah. possum poison. By the way, not a possum killing poison is a Dave Eggers novel. <laughs> uh, okay, so so here's the question: Does the anti venom whatever 
decay over time? Is it the kind of thing where 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 you could? Uh, is it the kind of thing where you have to have it in your system? Like for example, people who handle rattlesnakes or cobras all the time. Could they take this daily as a preventative, and then uh, I, if I they think get that's going to be a next step. I think you know the protein's probably going to break down in your blood, but you know this is going to be an interesting way to to research now that they've identified this protein. You know, I'll tell you, I was watching a very interesting documentary about cross species genetics last night in IMAX 3D, and oh uh, there was some very troubling side effects. <laughs> but maybe eventually in humans we could see this. Would be very useful. <laughs> How was it in IMAX 3D? It was awesome. Okay. Right. We need to talk about this after the next We will. We will. Break. So, uh, do we have a commercial break? We certainly do. Barstool Profits by Ethan Minsker is a book about the true nasty things that happened in New York City bars. It's now in paperback and ebook for as low as $1.99 on Amazon. It's an honest betrayal of the seedy underbelly of the busiest city in the world. Head on over. Get it right now. Barstool Profits by Ethan Minsker. And we very much uh, thank him for supporting the podcast so we uh we covered uh before a uh, a delightful story of bad parenting <laughs> about the piranha that bit off a child's finger oh my God. yes which by the way as soon as that happened uh i believe it was a friend of the show april ness confessed that she had a piranha and that, uh, and that is like, oh, it's so crazy that you guys were talking about that because I totally had a piranha, and I was just like, why? They're like, no, 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 they don't. You can stick your fingers in there, and they they sort of they sort of kiss does, them. They don't bite does them. Does she at also all. have a child? No, no, thankfully. Um, there are there but, are many different species of piranhas. Most of them will not chew off your finger. Yes, this one would. <laughs> but but <laughs> I think I think. Uh, that, I give the the weird things podcast okay for single chicks to own piranhas. That's a that's that's okay. Yay. Just don't put it near a kid. Okay, but so, but so you this realize... isn't really a bad parenting award. This is a Brian. You go into your nursery. Yes, for the okay. new new kid on the block. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And little uh, Bobo, little Bri Bri, little Bri Bri Bri. <laughs> yeah, baby Bri, baby Bri is all curled up there. Sure. Sup, son. And uh, what would be that your your child is alive? I'm not I'm not gonna have to go. What would be the most horrible thing that you could happen? <laughs> well, I think we could name that. Okay, uh, your child. Yeah, is, it, it, it like Spider Man, according to Brian. <laughs> child like, is still you're alive. no son of mine. <laughs> Get what out. would be a pretty horrifying thing to have happen to see to look uh, down at that crib and see? Uh, blah, 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 blah. his face be it's like Asian. blue. <laughs> Oh my God! Or besides, like he's like right written in crayon, "I will kill Daddy." <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like his face being bright blue, or him having like weird devil shapes all over his body—that'd be terrifying. Oh, uh, what do you have against devil shapes, Brian? Why are you so biased? Well, uh, I've seen The Exorcist. I don't know. The, the, <laughs> the defense rests. I don't. I, um, so you go look down there, and you see. Wrapped around your one-year-old sunlit on his foot is a python. That I, we I feel like we've talked about snakes eating my children before. What? Uh, so I walk in and there's a python, and which, by the way, I'm not entirely sure what a python. We had is. a snake biting your child. This is different. No, this, you're right. This snake is trying to devour the child. So okay, so so he's wrapping everything up. He's wrapped around the foot, and he's actually got the baby's foot in its mouth. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, uh, I mean, what do I do? Is that the question, or or how do I and feel you about don't it? We don't own a python, by the way. What's that? We don't, you don't own, own a, python? a python. Okay, well, yeah. I'm like Bonnie, we got to take this back to Walmart. <laughs> so uh, there was. Well, a I know you can poison it because a python. I'm pretty sure is not a possum. <laughs> I'm <laughs> pretty sure. So when we were in high school, we had somebody uh, come and give us a, a talk who was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And he had a bunch of colorful tales. Among them was being at the bottom of the pit and uh, having uh, a circle of, of Vietnamese soldiers over him laughing and taking bets as they threw a, a, a either a boa constrictor or a python or some very large snake in the pit with him. Uh, and they were betting on whether or not he would survive or not. And uh, and, and keep in mind, this is what these are the the tales that a Vietnam vet told us in in the uh, the high school. So I'm not gonna I'm not How gonna. How old back were him you? Up. 
17, 17. He was talking about this. It was brutal, man. It was like. I feel like, like that's like the kind of assembly I would have never got at my school. I feel like by the time that I went to high school, they, they had like scratched off that whole have an awesome Vietnam vet come and tell you like like super sweet war stories. No, no. <laughs> well, I mean, of course, the the, the theme of was, was not intended to be sweet. In fact, uh, what the. I'll give you the short version, but but this story with the python ends with he feels it starting to wrap around his arm and constrict him. And the one th it's dark. He can't see where the python is. And the one thing he thinks of is I need to find the head, which means I need to make this thing bite me so I can find the head. So he starts digging in with his fingernails like on a random section of the body and just keeps digging and digging. And then eventually the, the python bites him and then he finds the head and then he starts beating the head and biting it. Or what, he kills kills the python. Um the story ends, and this is at a high school. This is not even an assembly. This is in our history class where he gave this story like four or five times during throughout the, the day, uh, and he talks about how eventually he escaped and ran full blast through the middle of the night until he ran headfirst into like a mango tree and passed out from smacking his head into it, uh, woke up and there are mangoes all around him and he ate and then kept on running. And at some point, like, like this is at a high school story, he gets to a point where this little boy uh, helps him escape and he realizes just before he gets on the river that eventually he got back to, to civilization. He realizes that once they find out what this kid has done, uh, they are going to torture and kill this poor boy. And he uh, uh, grabs, he, he does the favor to the child. Okay. This is what he's, this is what he's telling high school students. So anyway, um, I would do that. I would try to make the Python bite me. <laughs> So I can say, oh, good God. God, I'm glad it was the first part of that story and not the last part of that story that you would not do the favor to your newborn son. <laughs> I, I, yeah, the, the, the end part and well, I saved him the trouble of a bullet by killing him. It sounds more like I killed the kids so they couldn't tell them which way I went. <laughs> uh, you know what? Maybe that was, and maybe, you know, we all tell ourselves stories about why we do the things that we do. But Why, uh, but, we, why we killed that nine-year-old Vietnamese boy in the jungle. Yeah, uh, I have that story. It's one of those things where it's like... Lots uh, of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, uh, you want to hear some? <laughs> I also have some I made up about <laughs> Vietnamese boys that I might want to kill. That is a horrific story. Uh, game over. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, Brian, do you realize, please put this in the Wikipedia. Never before has Andrew completely relented on his uh, on his, his weird scenario that endangered your child, but you broke him. You I, broke the pain. I, well, we, I mean, we start off with us, that Brian's known this all his life, has never told us about this awesome cage match that he got to hear about where a guy had to, you know, inflict pain on a on a on a python or bow or whatever the hell it is to get it to bite him so he could attack the head. And then and then how does the story end as the guy gets escaped, the nine year old Vietnamese boy who helps him get to safety, and then I had to break his neck so they wouldn't get to the child and hurt him. Uh, I had to do him the favor. Uh, yeah, dude. And well, and it's like, I mean, it's you are hearing the echoes of the echoes of a story I remember hearing 17 years ago. I mean, imagine being there in high school, having this guy like casually, because I mean, you know how it is. It's like, there's the event, but, but you tell the story. And at some point you just get polished on telling the story. And yeah. so he's very casually saying, yeah. So anyway, so I broke this nine year old's neck and then I, uh, then I went back home See, and I was really, annoyed that some hippies were trying to pull down the American flag. Like that was, that was how it followed the screwed up, up thing is that that Vietnamese boy and this is true, uh, it was actually at a Sitco station outside of Fort Drum after he got back. <laughs> hey, do you know which way to the base? That way. Oh, sorry. Oh, shouldn't have helped me. They find out. By the way, Come this here. Is... Come here, little ho chi. It's like, and my I'm name's like, Kevin. I'm like about to go. I, like, I got to do you a favor. And I'm like about to go. And that Python story is a testament to how vicious and mean the Viet Cong really were. And then, oh, by the way, yeah, I killed the kid that helped me escape. I'm like, all right, done. Never I'll, mind. I'll tell you what, I, I will Worst not bad. I will not presume to judge people who have been in that kind of position. It is it is horrifying and the the the, the horrors of war as made real through the Vietnam media experience and those people who are still alive to tell the stories uh, just utterly break my heart. And it's like it, it fundamentally changes me. It's like, how can you hear that kind of story? And then I, I, I don't know. I don't I don't want to go into that. No, I'm going no, no, to Brian. I, I, I agree. I mean, it's it's not like I don't think that guy went off to war with the intention of, you know, snapping a nine year old's no. neck. Um, 
I uh, I had a friend whose uh, grandfather escaped from a Russian gulag. No way. And you know, there's the way the story was told to me is uh, the grandfather I met the grandfather, neat guy, tough guy, just tough, tough old guy. He's strong the like kid, bull. The kid explained to him said, "Yeah, uh, he escaped with three guys. He was the only one that survived, and he won't talk about what they did for food." Oh no! And so I meet this guy, and he shakes my hand, and I'm like. This guy has probably eaten another human being. And it's like, meanwhile, like smash cut to his vision of you, and he just sees you in a steak costume with a little Andrew head on oh, top. Oh, and you're he, like, he goes and, he, and, he, and he, he hits me on the chest, and he goes, I bet you work out. And I'm like, I'm already being sized up for <laughs> you're, like, you're like, I'm, uh, I'm free range. I'm free range. Uh, I eat a lot of toxins. A <laughs> lot of toxins. Uh, yeah, yeah, poisons. Uh. And I'm not local. If you're thinking okay. that, <laughs> you're, not, you're like, I'm uh, I'm filled with HGH, human growth oh, hormone, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, probably, probably not healthy. No. But uh, I don't know, Ryan. I thought that was a cool story until uh, the Python <laughs> no. fighter snapping. I'll tell you, you know, what. It, next. In terms of the horrors of war thing, I'm just going to go file my moral judgment of that under, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, oh, God, I don't know. I really don't know. That's the file that one goes in. <laughs> All right. Well, I do want to let everybody know that you can learn how to make fireworks in Minecraft using TNT and redstone or mega magnetic ferrofluid with laser printer toner if your name was Haley Nelson. And uh, that's who gets a shout out today. Haley Nelson here on the Weird Things podcast. Dude, that's Hello, awesome. Haley. That is awesome. This is all known? This could be done? Uh, to be honest with you, our our input field sometimes for the weird things sponsor reads cut things off. So I, I, I changed that, by the way. So anybody, there's an email address to send us. Uh, if you send it to sponsor at weird things, we will get the full message. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll probably replace this in in the final version, but because uh, I already I emailed the person to see what the what the point was. But yeah. well, but right now, Haley, yo, bro, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so, meanwhile, let's go back to aliens for a second. Very interesting idea has been circulating. It's not an old idea. It not a new idea. It's been in science fiction. Uh, there was a BBC series talked about this. Stanislaw Lim talked about it. It's made into a couple books and some movies, but it is something to think about. One of the things we've been doing with SETI at home is using computers to try to search through the SETI signals that the space telescopes have been picking up, trying to find some sort of pattern or proof that there's extraterrestrial intelligence out there. Meanwhile, yesterday was a big day where computers that were infected with a virus, a particular nasty uh, Trojan, were going to be blocked from accessing the web if they uh, were still had the, you know, you know, the, the giving off whatever the open ports were sending that kind of traffic. A couple people brought up the idea of what happens if aliens decide to just make us download a virus. Wait, 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 wait. What if, and, and, and they got from... the idea from Will Smith and Independence Day? Are you talking about a computer virus or a human virus? Computer virus, something. I mean, some sort of pattern designed to wreak havoc that's being transmitted out there. You know, and, and Jodie Foster and the contact in the book and then the movie, Jodie Foster, you know, they, hey, build this, guys. Build this. Well, yeah, build it. I mean, wouldn't build it. Just build it. Wouldn't that. Just build it. <laughs> wouldn't that in, a, in and of itself satisfy the definition of, of a virus? Not, because a virus is not necessarily. Uh, malignant. It doesn't necessarily do damage to you. It just wants to self -repli self replicate. And so, in that regard, this technology, if it was awesome and if everybody wanted it, and they sent it out to the stars, it would be self replicating technology, right? Well, I mean, a virus, you know, infects a host system and takes over the host resources to replicate itself. So, uh, but but that's not what we mean when we say. Uh, well, do you call sperm a virus? <laughs> computer virus. Do you what? call sperm a virus? I don't. I don't think so because sperm can't. Sperm. Well, I guess sperm does make more sperm eventually. It's a very <laughs> okay. slow my moving point virus. Is, <laughs> my point is, should we? We got set at home. We've got thousands of computers now trying to decode, looking for alien signals. What do we get? To, I mean, maybe what a way to wipe us out. Forget about you know, uh, trying to annihilate us with space weapons and stuff. They're like, hey guys, here's a little piece of code. Yeah, Go ahead. put it together. Go ahead. <laughs> 
but but the problem. Okay, this is a cool idea. The problems are number one. Uh, you could wipe out our technology with this, but you couldn't wipe us out. The only way you would wipe out humanity is if the virus self-replicated and then gave instructions to our computers telling them to facilitate the construction of physical entities that could damage us. What if it, you know, what if it's a virus that takes over, you know, our nuclear launch systems? What if it's a virus that takes over pharmacy labs and, you know, when we're, we have these little oh, no, that's good. coding so things and starts to create, you know, violent plagues out of DNA no, so, or So RNA. essentially it's Skynet. It's an artificially intelligent, self-learning, self-teaching thing that can we, understand we, the context We, of using our technology, our technology can make Iranian centrifuges blow up by overriding the controller speeds and cause them to spin apart. Alle awesome. Allegedly. Unless, allegedly. Well, unless you are, you ask directly. Yeah, a new like, book came like, out. Like, like, like Will says, somebody character. says the Israelis may be behind this. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, apparently the, the the American forces uh, who were aware of that this was going on are like Will Ferrell's character in Austin Powers. Like you just have to ask him three times, and uh, you know, eventually they just spill the beans on everything. Uh, so yeah, uh, but I guess my only problem with this is like, for this to happen and for an alien race to understand what is compatible and have the sophistication of what our system is, like, isn't that kind of so many steps beyond like no, no, why okay. don't we just talk and make contact or all there's right. some element of like familiarity that i mean okay first of all you're right in that if somebody's interested in communication they're probably interested in you know uh, uh you know free trade and so on but let's say that all they wanted to do is all other organics must be destroyed and we must be on top and let's assume they're crazy intelligent they could send out a signal that has multiple phases. The first phase is a rudimentary uh, artificial intelligence that essentially is a virus that lodges itself in computers on the internet, and it just exists as a totally dumb thing that observes and collects data somewhere. Uh, when the second part of the signal is received, uh, once the first signal is fully developed as a, a self-aware intelligence infected in the American or in the uh, the Earth's internet system. Then uh, once that finishes, the second part of the signal activates the desire to analyze and construct, you know, we'll say 20 different possible plans to destroy humanity and take over the world. Uh, and then finally, the third part of the signal comes in saying, OK, now you've handled all that self-evaluate by these sets of rules, which of them is most likely to take out humanity. Uh, or I, and, and by the way, I'm using humanity, but I'm saying, you know, like whatever the local indigenous species is that needs to be wiped out and then activate. Uh, so essentially you could have like that's what we have with satellite radio and, and satellite TV programming is the satellites have no idea what the boxes are doing. It's doing everything from up on top. It says if yeah. then, if then, if then. And there's no reason you couldn't have a signal like that from an alien species as long as especially if, if built into that first level signal was the the encouragement of or like you build into the first level signal tantalizing secrets that are extraordinarily valuable to the indigenous population to where you know we'll say for sake of discussion the cure for cancer the location of you know the the local dyson spheres or whatever you know something in there that's so irresistible they continue to listen to the signal and continue to infect themselves as they go forward and then all of a sudden, you, you know, you have these three phases and then it wipes I guess, I guess the, it, just, it just assumes so much knowledge that like it just seems like, yes, like this could work. But like uh, under what, like to what end beyond like global annihilation, it said it and forget it. <laughs> uh, to me, it's no more outrageous than the idea that. Uh, alien civilization would be so super intelligent that they could overcome what we perceive to be right now fundamental limitations of physics in order to physically come to earth like which, which is more weird that they would be so smart that they could think of all these contingencies and write an automatic or artificial intelligence program to do this or that they would physically be able to warp time and space in order to physically come here can i can i throw out a, a hypothesis sure uh, imagine, you know, we're finding a lot of planets. We're finding worlds, you know, within, let's say, a 30-light-year sphere around us. You know, there are, there are 
hundreds of stars, thousands of stars probably put in that space, you know, which means there's a ton of planets, a ton of places for life. If you had a space colonizing race, they could be with that, let's say within a 30 light year sphere, right? How old is Fortran? Like what, 40 years? Maybe, maybe 50? It's about 50, 60 years. Yeah. So we've been sending that out to probes since the middle of the 20th century. We've been broadcasting computer instruction right not in, not even encrypted oh, not that okay. that would matter what we use level of encrypting so those zeros and ones an intelligent civilization come in there and say oh this is machine language this is what's being transmitted to us well, and 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 i think for sake of our discussion you would have to assume that not only are these aliens wicked smart but that they've also seen so many civilizations come and go that by the time they see our fortran they're able to, uh, if not understand us and our culture, at least put us into a category. We're like, ah, oh. they're like these oh, Baldashians. We, we, could, we could, I mean, if we if we just got a naked Fortran signal to a probe without knowing anything else about it, you're going to probably recognize what's, you know, back and forth. If you followed both data streams, you're going to know, you're going to be able to tell what's telemetry data. You're going to be able to tell what's motor control. You're going to be able to tell a lot from that. And so the idea there is, is that in the more pieces you get of that as other transmissions go out there, as we've started, we've been sending, you know, using radio transmission, you know, computer code, stuff like that. So you could listen to these zeros and ones and an intelligent might be, you know, species might be able to say approximate something from that, you know, maybe take over a probe a little bit to see what happens. I, I got to tell you, I think you have totally brought me over to your side. I'm going to say if I have to pick which is more likely an alien virus broadcast from a super intelligent being that has a master plan to wipe out humanity and is or, or through you know all biology indigenous to different planets versus them physically getting here and shooting death rays at us i i got to say i think your suggestion is way more plausible i mean yeah. it's what we do now but our first step is we try to deactivate the networks of the you know of the nations that were at war with before try, shut down their communication systems take over all that preemptively now places like Iran trying to even stop them from developing you know is are there NASA and not that I believe that we'll ever be able to go fast in life but are there you know think if there was some sort of NASA hyperspace project where they keep getting little bugs in the computer or is our fusion problem the reason we can't get a fusion stable fusion reactor going because aliens are trying to oh stop my us God. From that's awesome that's such a great idea what, oh, what if what if it's not a wipe out humanity thing what if it's a Keep all other Manage civilizations humanity. in their petri dish. Like, like, yeah, no, it's, not exactly. It's, it stop yes. them from developing this. We, we're happy with you guys living. We just don't want you having this. That's way good. Because we're too dangerous to have it. Or what if, what if, essentially, what if, That's essentially, awesome. this alien civilization is the last survivor of a, a galactic cold war, right? Where it's seen the ravages of what happens whenever, essentially what the way the United States perceives itself as the defenders of liberty worldwide, where it's like, we're doing this for your own good type thing, where it's like they've dealt with millennia of war and they said, nobody should get past this phase. And we're going to send out the signal to everyone to infect everything everywhere to keep them from getting off their Petri dishes. That's brilliant. So they're, they're, uh, you know, global nationalist. I mean, or like, but what is what is uh, the protectionist? The the idea that uh, we're not going to that everybody should be dealing it within their own borders. Uh, non -inter interventionist. Isolationist. Isolationist. That's it. Ron Paul. I said non interventionism is not the same as isolationism. You can't have free trade with everyone and call that isolationism. Uh, so well, there's our I thought of the day. We we have we have picks to come, but I I feel like uh, unless Andrew you want to make your pick the topic that I know that we're going to scream about for the next fifteen <laughs> minutes, uh, we should just start screaming about it. Uh, let's yeah, let's go ahead and move to picks right now. All right, my pick is the movie Drive on Netflix. Instant watch right now. Is it good? It's very very awesome. Yeah. Very it's much good. enjoyed it. I didn't see it when it came out. A lot of people already saw it, but you can watch it now and watch it in streaming. It's an extremely well-told story. If you go and watch expecting like Fast and the Furious or a racing movie, you'll yeah. be disappointed. If you go in there expecting a really well-told character study, much like The Amazing Spider-Man, you're going to enjoy it very, very much because they're both awesome. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, can we can we just talk about Spider Man really quick? All right, uh, are we going to do spoilery talk or non spoilery? Uh, I don't. I I, I think. We can discuss it all within things that are known. It is known that the villain. Well, no, let, let's let's do or let let's get other picks out front, and okay. then if people right. want to listen to Spider Man, right. then they You're can right. listen to Spider Man. Coming they can coming turn it up off. will be a dissection of the Spider, okay. so to speak. Uh, my pick, uh, Brian mentioned it before, uh, Lock and Key. I really enjoy Lock and Key. I'm on book four now. I will say there are elements of the plot that are really gnawing at me and are really starting to annoy me. Uh, but hopefully they will resolve themselves as we go how, further. How far into, into it are you right now? Uh, I'm like probably three, three issues, trades, like comic book issues into book four. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, it's it's just it's starting to get a little wily coyote to me. Where it's uh, like uh, book four is where it changes. Book four, okay. some massive changes happen, and in fact, there's a a strong structural shift. That that affects everything, and then from then on out, like after this, you'll start reading the individual issues, and then uh, uh, when you do, you'll 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 realize that the story's gotten much much bigger and much okay. More I hope I hope so because uh, I, I I feel like that that's where we're due we're kind of overdue for that where where the story is now. But uh, the Joe Hill is the writer, Stephen King's son. We've talked about this before. Sure, uh, I enthusiastically give it a thumbs up. Go check it out. Although. Like father, like son, they do share quite a weakness for uh, insane, uh, insane conservative caricatures of like the the people that are just super like they, there's not just like the person who's kind of a bad guy, but also sort of conservative. It's like they're like screaming homophobes or like wild racists. And, uh, you know, Wait, that's, I don't even that, remember this. When was this? Well, there's the whole thing in the bar. With the oh uh, yeah, yeah yeah okay no, yeah, yeah that's, that's uh, fair and it's all, it's like it's it's like it's not even like hey these people are homophobic it's like they're also retarded and talking about how they wash their hands with anti-Semitic soap right and like right right, right. uh like un unironically not realizing that they're getting the words wrong and it's like uh yeah so that being said and that's a minor such a minor 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 quibble but uh great fantasy work done by Joe Hill. So, let me let me go ahead and hop on board with that. I and I'm only mentioning this because you started talking about comics. I've gotten back into digital comics uh mainly because I I bought an iPad just so we could take pretty pictures of the new Scam School book on the Retina display, but uh and I was totally going to return it until I started using the Comixology app and reading Lock and Key was exquisite on it. It was gorgeous and doing the frame by frame view was amazing and it reminded me a lot about how one year one and a half years ago uh, I started reading Why the Last Man which uh, which I enjoyed. I downloaded all the episodes I could on Comixology and it was Justin who was such a passing just as I've been pitching Lock and Key to Justin, Justin was so on board with me reading Why the Last Man that he actually sent me uh, two dozen of the episodes uh, in the trades that he had to finish out the story and it was amazing. Why, uh, read Why the Last Man and hop on Comixology. It's awesome. All right. Now, ding, ding, ding. If you don't want to hear about Spider-Man, shut the podcast off because we're going to get down and dirty into it. Okay. So uh, let me just say to back up, my, I, I did a pre-pick last week because I was going to see the Midnight uh, Amazing Spider-Man. In a nutshell, uh, I was absolutely over the moon for it. I thought it was easily and like not even on the same, the, it, it ain't even the same league. It ain't even the same sport. As, as the other uh, Spider-Man movies, far and away, super awesome. I thought Andrew Garfield was uh, amazing. He was the Peter Parker that I, I didn't even realize I wanted and how different uh, the, the Tobey Maguire version was, but far closer to what I wanted out of that character. And uh, I am not only super excited and over the moon for that movie, but I'm excited for that universe. And I think what, what Brian is going to take exception to is two issues uh, number one, that it's the best Spider-Man movie ever. And number two, that uh, I said it was the, for me, it was the Batman Begins of Spider, of, of the Spider-Man universe in where, in which it set up at the end of it, not only did I enjoy the movie, but I was extraordinarily excited for the larger universe for which it could paint. So uh, real quick, before I say anything, Andrew, you liked it as well, right? That was your pick last week. I, I, I agree with every one of Justin's points about that. Um, I also will say that, and, and I have to separate my love from it 
from my frustration with what Raimi did. And I was, I'm a big Ra- Sam Raimi fan, but I thought his handling of Spider-Man was, was ham fisted that he did not understand or did not, maybe did, did not communicate what made Peter Parker a complex, interesting personality. Raimi's Spider-Man is the story of a dorky kid with viewer redeeming values who takes super steroids to impress the white trash girl next door. Um, and all of the things that made Parker such an interesting character to me as a teenager, the reason I fell in love with Spider-Man, all those things I loved about him were absent in, in Raimi's Spider-Man, which I'm fine with, you know, somebody doing their own version of it. But then seeing Mark Webb's version, what he did and and uh, what I felt, how much I enjoyed it and, and the little all the little details that went into it. Uh, I just very much, very much over the moon, love the movie. Wow. That is utterly surprising. Now, first of all, let me let me say. Uh, I went in with extremely high expectations because I as trust, you're prone to do. Uh, well, well no, I, I no, I'll, I'll take the heat on that because I I came I was on NSFW show, you know, just screaming and yelling about how it was the best thing ever. Well, well, and, and I I heard two things. Number one, it was the best Spider-Man movie of all of them, and number two, yes. it was the uh, the Batman Begins of of, of uh, Spider-Man. And what I hoped to get from that was that uh, we would have a story. That is uh, more interesting with characters more developed than Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man 2 was clearly the best of the Sam Raimi franchise. Uh, You had a villain that you understood and almost sympathized with. Uh, It was it was uh, phenomenal in that it was patient and it gave time for all of the characters to do things that made sense. Um, The the other thing was that um, uh, Batman Begins, part of the thing that I love about Bat- Batman Begins was the believability of all of the things structurally that went into it. There's, in many comic book movies, you have to swallow a pill in order to enjoy the ride. You're like, this is going to be really stupid, but swallow this pill, and after this, you're going to have a really good time. Once you sh- swallow this idea that a radioactive spider bite gives you superpowers, uh, then n- the rest of it will be downhill. Uh, I, I did not have that experience. Now, granted, there, there are things that I really, truly loved about The Amazing Spider-Man. Number one, I thought Andrew Gar- Garfield and Emma Stone have genuine chemistry as a couple. I thought they were much more believable and enchanting to watch their budding romance happen. Um, I thought that uh, 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 Martin Sheen as uh, Uncle Ben was uh, very, Amazing. very he was lovable. Great. He was great. Um Pretty much everyone else was one-dimensional and flat uh, at best, and and uh, even Spider-Man, when when Gwen Stacy is not there, Peter Parker is a, a one-dimensional douche who's sour and dour. What I remember from the comic books is that he was clever and funny. And once he put on that costume, everything was a joke to him, and that's part of what you loved about it. You only got one scene that even hinted at that, and it was spoiled in the in the movies. The Lizard Man could have been, of all the characters we've seen, the most engaging, because he has a genuine deformity and a genuine reason to, uh, to want to achieve uh, humanity again. And instead of making this a struggle of a man who is imperfect and broken wanting to restore his body, instead they made it... Uh, this bizarre uh, Third Reich tale of the, sea, the the search for perfection, and they made him one dimensional and silly. Where it's like uh, I I understand that that he is conflicted. Uh, he's got the serum, and has got the side effect of making him a rampaging lizard man, uh, and he shouldn't want to take it again. But uh, but I want to be sold on the idea that in his position, I might have done the same thing. And there was nothing even close to that. There was also um, massive, there were so many things that wouldn't have taken very much to sell me on, but they just never made the effort. For example, there's a moving scene, this is a spoiler, uh, there's a moving scene when all the union workers decide to help Spider-Man by aligning their cranes in, a, in an appropriate pattern to make it easy for him to go. That scene would have made sense if I had seen anything before this moment about how New York City felt about Spider-Man. And that was what was great about the first movie, is the first movie you had uh, the demonization of him in the media from J. Jonas Jameson, who I understood his character. I understood he wanted to sell papers. I understood that uh, that he didn't really care, but he just wanted to make hay. And I saw that they took the time to tell the story that despite that, New York City loved the guy and they wanted to make something happen. So as a result, in Spider-Man 2, when, when, his, when the chips were down and Spider-Man was in trouble, it was great to see the city rally around him. 
Unfortunately, there was nothing resembling that at this pivotal moment in The Amazing Spider-Man, and instead, it's just totally arbitrary. You have the police chief who just hates him, I don't know, because he's got a mask, and then uh, and that's that's about the most you get about what people feel about this guy. So this big sweeping moment with the music playing and everybody on aligning their their cranes, I just, I just don't care because I don't believe it because I don't I don't understand why any of them should give a rat's ass about this. Well, guy. It's, it's well, the kids, I mean, you're you're the, missing the over why the guy who made the initial call to do that did decided to do that. I mean, there was an important plot point that happened for why he was motivated and what happened. And we you can know, spoil it. This is we can spoil this. We can, okay. Well, I mean, it, it was the the part of the Peter Parker story is the idea of him having these sort of these these father figures, these mentors, and and his arc. He had a, he had a very very interesting arc in the story that he didn't have in the first one or any of the other ones. Did really to speak of there was a little bit of one of the Doc Ock where he could kind of see what would have happened if he'd become the scientist sort of thing. And, and Parker, by the way, in the comics is always a very dark, dark, tormented guy. He's had a horrible life. That's been, you know, his parents go leave when he's a kid. He's poor. He's always had these bad things happen around him. And compared to all the other Marvel comic superheroes, where being a superhero is generally a pretty awesome thing, for Spider-Man, you know, he's a kid who's maybe on his pathway to become the next science genius. He has to go out at night and be Spider-Man, so he's not being able to do his books. He has to take a part-time job. And, you know, when he goes out for help to the Fantastic Four in the comics, you know, because he wants to make money, he gets speeches from Reed Richards about how it's not about money while he's on the top of the Baxter Tower surrounded by billions of dollars in scientific apparatus. And that was the kind of idea is that, you know, Spider-Man is always sort of like, you know, the, the very blue collar kind of superhero. Um, in this story, you know, he, he ha there's an evolution from him where he's this dark kid who has to deal with a lot of stuff, same as in the comic. The Uncle Ben character is much, much better. Some people were upset that Martin Sheen didn't do the, you know, with great power, you know, comes great responsibility line. I which, think oh, they covered that amply well in the first movie. Yeah, and in the yeah. original Amazing, you know, Amazing Stales where Spider-Man first appeared, Uncle Ben didn't say that. That was a commentary in a box. People remember, oh, in the legendary Uncle Ben line. Later on, they retconned it, but that was not, did not come from Uncle Ben. He had like two lines in the first comic. Anyhow, side note. Um, I thought Martin Sheen was great. Although he does, he does do -si do around it. He is. It's like, well, you know, you do with yeah. But anyhow, some people were taking you know, like Harry Knowles and Andy Cool was upset. Harry Knowles are like, oh, and it's like it's not. It's like having Hamlet not say his famous lines. It's like, well, go back and read the comics you said you read, Harry. Um, anyhow, my Woo, point is, just there's, fired. Mentor, there's mentors who come into play. Okay, so you have the Uncle Ben, and then you get the Dennis Leary, the Captain Stacy mentor. Okay. Two things happen. There's a dinner. T there's a dinner scene. Two things happen at that scene. One, Peter Parker realizes at that point he's just a vigilante. He's not a guy trying to save people. He's a guy just out there, you know, trying to find the guy who killed his uncle Ben. And then the next time he goes out, then he's he goes after the lizard. Then he goes out there and he starts taking care of people. And there's that change. The second thing is, up until that point, Captain Stacy is trying to just kill Spider Man. But then when or you know, however, whatever means possible. If you noticed, when they're going to pursue Spider-Man after that, they're using non-lethal weapons because Peter Parker's defense of "I think Spider-Man is this" is this sort of Stacy scene. So that there's this other perception to him. Wait, so wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. It sounded like you said they were using to hunt Spider-Man non-lethal weapons, but I clearly remember him being shot with the yeah. Gun. He was no, he no, was no. The one, the one cop Captain goes Captain rogue Stacey's after his helicopter crew was using the electric things. It was a cop on the ground who responded to it. it was not part of the patrol trying to find him that shot him. Okay. Again, they can spoon feed things things to you. You're upset about the camera. Remember, Peter Parker's poor. He's not going to have a brand new Canon Mark V with a no, 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 no. Okay, all right, bet, 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 bet. all right. Let's talk about the camera because this it, is this is horse he's crap. Poor. He's going to use his dad's old camera, and he's a science nerd, so of course he's going to want to spend no, time in the dark no, room. No, no, no. You don't get no. to say that. It is more expensive to buy film and have it de de uh, developed chemically, and to and to have mechanical triggers for you uh nowadays photography of that ma of that variety is a boutique industry reserved for the purest who can afford it meanwhile Brian, coming from show, a dark I'm sorry, room i thought i was talking used to spend high school inside the dark room doing that okay if you're a science geek you develop your own film okay you go on there and do your own sure and sure stuff. and when you're doing your art that's what you do but when you need a practical way to document and you can't afford a five thousand dollar camera are you ready you ready to hear it Go and say it. Okay. You haven't acknowledged my points. Just continue. Uh, uh, well, I, I haven't finished what I've been able to say. So I, if, if, if I have your permission, I would like to continue uninterrupted. Uh, here's no. the thing. <laughs> 
Here's the thing. All of that would be correct if you were talking about artistry or whatever. But when your goal is to document you fighting a giant lizard man, maybe you should, I don't know, use the, the cell phone that they prominently featured you playing a video game on, set up with the automatic picture-taking app that's available on everyone's cell phone now. It was jarring and ridiculous. Why would he not just set that up to auto-take pictures every five seconds? What I, possible justification is there for them? Because well, he can't he play games do, on it. <laughs> when you want to do surveillance photography, he's in a sewer. He would be using a low light film. He'd be using a camera with a big this lens and a wide angle lens. Okay, okay look, look the, the mere fact that we're having this conversation means, means it, the movie failed. It failed to tell no. the story in a believable way. No, this it is, means that you're it, obsessing it over me, details you. because you, you're, you're, you're losing the side of the story. You're missing the story because you're getting there. Why does he have a camera? Why does he have? I, and you can't conceive of an explanation for it, so you obsess over it. I'll tell you what. Uh, you're when, looking for when, a reason to pick it apart. Okay, uh, because well, Justin loved it. No, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to tell you what I think. No, <laughs> I, it's more fun no. what I do. Yeah. Uh, all right, look, here's the thing. I watched Men in Black, and I wasn't caught up at all in the how or the what or the why. I was too busy having a good time because the movie did it jobs. It, it, it told me the story, and the story was so engaging, I didn't have time to think about crap. When a movie like this sets up a distracting and unnecessary uh, our, our, uh, distraction, it's like I understand the aesthetic of doing it, but don't. Uh, how can you defend that and not defend Prometheus? I, I don't understand this. It's the same crap. It's like it's it's a it's a failure Wait, of the storytelling. You're not. You're not are we talking about the story? Or are you talking about a detail that 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 you didn't understand? Uh, okay. Let me just let me just flatly state what I believe, and you can you can handle these however you want. Number one, I will say this: all the characters were one dimensional and boring and predictable outside of uh, Peter Parker's romance with Gwen Stacy and Uncle Ben. I can't think of a single character that said anything surprising or engaging that really sucked me in. Uh, I saw plenty of characters acting in ways inconsistent with what they had set up that made no sense to me. Uh, the story was predictable. Uh, the, the biggest problem was one of the things they did on this movie that they didn't do in the Sam Raimi movies, all of the Spidey stuff was computer graphics in the Sam Raimi movies, uh, partly because they could finally do it and they were excited to do that kind of thing. The, the, the backlash on that was, well, it doesn't really look like a human. It looks like a, all CG. So the, the thinking with this movie was, why don't we do more shots with practical effects with real men swinging around on ropes holding stuff, which makes sense. Unfortunately, what it does is it actually highlights how cartoonish the action gets once they flip the switch over going to CG. Everything suddenly way looks like it's made out of rubber. I don't believe or care about anything. I thought the Lizard Man was horribly disappointing. Uh, I would have loved a villain that I could almost understand where he was coming from, and they didn't give me that at all. Um, I will, in, in defense of, of, of the Lizard, the idea there is that he is Doc Connors is a very, very good man. When he's fully Doc Connors, he's a very good man. Under there are circumstances by which he has to inject himself with this. And the problem is, is it takes away a bit of his humanity. And a big theme in that movie was the best people were the people without the powers. And when you get powers, you can do great things, you can do bad things. And then Connors, in trying to do a good thing, his intention was he was trying to do a very, very noble good thing, oversteps and puts himself where all of a sudden this thing has taken over an aspect of his personality fully. And that's why he goes back into it, because he never goes back to normal. There's never, you know, he, he still has the lizard aspect of him. You still see the skin. He's still got the lizard in him. And that's what makes him go do it again and again, is that the lizard is still there. Uh, and so his actions to me were fine. And again, he, he is a, such a small part of the whole story. I just, you know, I, I, I walked out of that movie going, man, this was this was the Peter Parker I wanted, the science geek. I got a kid who actually was convincingly into science and not just a kid who was an autistic dork with a you know, Richard Feynman screensaver that was the only thing that told us he was into science. Because remember, Raimi was the guy that said, I don't think people would buy him building his own web shooters. Well, part of the point of Peter Parker was he was supposed to be a science genius. Where Raimi wanted to make this this wish fulfillment movie, you know, that the every man kid would look at and say, that could be me. And it was really a story about a kid taking steroids to impress the white trash girl. And that's what my problem with that one was. And there was not an arc to the story in that Spider-Man and that in the real origin story. It was just this responsibility. You got to be good with this. We're here. We got this kid who's dark, does dark things, and he has life just smack him in the face and he changes and he has to evolve. And that I love that. I love that because it was about adolescence, about being an adolescent, making those sort of bad choices. I mean, I guess he, the things that I thought were kind of exceptional about the movie, uh, you know, and and to, I guess 
Brian, I, I personally kind of found a little bit more dimension with with Captain Stacy in in particular than than I guess you did. Uh, you know, I I very much enjoyed kind of there were a lot of subtle uh, you know ideas of like what is the nature of his uh, secret identity and you know where does he uh, prioritize that in in his life as he kind of comes to grips with what these powers mean for him and that's sort of crystallized you know the turning point is where he is up on the on the roof with Gwen Stacy and he finds it easier to tell her that he's Spider-Man than to kiss her uh and that's and that's kind of once he's done that then he can do the other thing but one comes before the other uh and it's not until the end that he kind of has a an example for him that now that he has Gwen in his life somebody who understands power captain stacy as the you know proprietor of law and order for the city of new york has to explain to him that you know what this attracts and and what that means in the context of his journey uh, i i liked i don't know i this there's there's really not a whole lot about the movie that i that i i didn't and, i didn't like we, i guess maybe maybe i'm just i'm i'm projecting more of when we're not of, gonna and everybody has to go. I mean, everybody's gonna. We, you know, we're not gonna make Brian. Not, Brian is very, very justified for what Brian wants out of a story. What it justifies. I'm not gonna go like Brian. You're wrong. You're not because your experience is very much your experience. And in, in that, I will. I will say that from the audience reaction, this is already rated higher from fans. I mean, from the audience, not critics. From audiences, is rated higher on both Rotten Tomatoes than all the three Spider-Man movies in IMDb. Yeah, People but uh, have, well, I mean, but on on that, if you're if you're gonna play that game, I mean, the the well, what, numbers what, are descending on Rotten Tomatoes very quickly, and that's that's why, it, that's why last week it hasn't gone down. That's that's why Tom Merritt didn't go see it was because like they 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 uh, heard the reviews and they were about to go see it, and then they then they heard that they were just declining. No, he didn't Tomatoes. go see it because Ryan Block said that he he shouldn't go. It's not that's gone. What, it's been. It's well, been. What, it's been at the same level for the last for the last like, four what, days. I'm, I'm only saying what Tom Merritt told well, me. Well, so but you're you're telling me you Tom Merritt told out, me. But it's not. Okay. It's it's a it's hearsay, Brian. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this much. I'll tell you this much. Is that there is there is a a lot of people love this movie. A lot of people love this movie, and and right now a lot of people love it more than the other ones. And not say that everybody's going to, you know. And a lot of people who criticize this were like, "Why are we doing a reboot?" And it's like. To me, to go into that, which you didn't bring up, and I'm not putting it on you, but to even to go into like why does this exist is such an unfair thing to go into try to judge a movie. Well, I already told you that's that's the reason I wanted this to be amazing because I was part of the hater crowd when they were rebooting Batman Begins, and then I went in and I was so blown away by Batman Begins that it's like I don't care if you do a reboot 20 minutes after the original if it's good, let it be good and let me be blown away by it. And especially that's part of what had me so excited because Justin said this was the Batman Begins of the Spider-Man series. I'll tell you, I I can forgive a lot of things. I could forgive one-dimensional characters. I can forgive um, uh, things that are inconsistent with how I read a comic book or what I expected the guy to be. I was dis- personally, I was disappointed in the character who was um, Peter Parker. He was dour and pouty and not very interesting. What I cannot forgive God, the movie for. I mean, for, that's the comic, though. No, and it, it was no. very interesting in the comic. I thought he's very much more interesting in this movie. But okay, uh, what I cannot forgive the movie for is being boring in the third act. By the third act. I didn't care. I didn't care about a single character in the whole thing. And that I got to put on the movie. That's not, that's not me. That's me. That's, this is me. Somebody who's predisposed to love these characters. I read uh, hundreds of the comics. I love everything about it. I had high expectations. I was willing and excited to forgive all different kinds of things. But at the end of the day, if I don't care about the characters, that's not my fault. That's the film's yeah. fault. The but film that's, fails. That's, to... I mean, that's exactly how I felt about the Avengers was the third act. I go, man, I'm watching Transformers three. You're it's crazy, the same, dude. The, the Avengers was point. amazing. The Avengers was amazing. I understood but every the third, one of those I mean, again, for me, I'm looking at the third act. It. I'm going, oh, wow, this is the same thing that happened in Avengers Transformers 3. I'm watching these guys go to the city to stop the alien portal while they try to get, I mean, but with, with it Avengers was, jokes. It was, it, was, it was Transformers done with the context. It was Transformers done right. Maybe we're just, maybe I don't, maybe we're just different people. I don't know. I like I'll, Avengers, I'll say though. this. I don't, me, I don't have the hate uh, on the Avengers like you do for the Spider-Man. Uh, you know, in terms of the Avengers versus Spider-Man or, or in comparison to Spider-Man. I love I love both movies. Uh, I love the Avengers for what it is, which is a exhibition of 
let's get a bunch of heroes together, tell very simple stories, and have things explode in conflict in the biggest possible way. That's what I loved about those Avengers comics. That's I just imagined I the, the thing exploding when you said that. That's what I loved about the Avengers movie. Sorry, Arizona the dog just ran into the room. Uh, uh, He's got I, an opinion. I love Spider-Man for it being a very... You know, it was it was the exact kind of story that I wanted out of a far more complex character and a more complex story. And to me, that's see, harder I guess, I to guess do. That's, that's I I don't believe that. I think that's a patently false statement. I don't believe that the characters are more complex. I found Liar! Them, I, I found them way more boring and predictable and one dimensional. It's uh, you know, and and okay. and. I mean, I'm just I mean, I'm just saying what my opinion is. Yeah. No. Like, and, and, right. Right. No. I and I'm trying to. Anytime I disagree with somebody about art, my goal is not to convince anyone of my opinion because you can't do that. My goal is to no. find out what is the point at which I diverge with another person. And so it sounds to me like uh, there's there's something to be explored there that the same characters I found boring and predictable were the same characters that you found more complex and more interesting. Well, if I may interject, yeah. though, like, you know, when when we throw out words like or terms like one dimensional and stuff, I for me, I would look at it, go objectively, I'd go like, OK, what is the character description of of Captain Stacy at the beginning of the movie and when we first meet him, what's the character description of Captain Stacy at the end of the movie, other than the very big important detail? What is this what has changed about him? And I would say that like with Connors, I'd go, what was it what was about him different and what was that? And so like I would say, like, oh no, I could tell you where they are emotionally, how they are different as people. So I don't see them as is and like and I gotta tell you, Aunt May, like I can't even remember the actress that played Aunt May in the first Spider-Man movies. Sally Fields as Aunt May was great, and I mean, I, I thought the guy who did, you know, uh, was a uh, Robert Forrest was, you know, in uh, the original. I thought he was good, but my God, watching Charlie Sheen's Martin Sheen, uh, Martin, uh, Sheen. Him, no, Charlie, Charlie Sheen's, Sheen's father, dad, <laughs> give a speech that he would give to Charlie Sheen. Watching Martin Sheen perform this, so uh, and, I, and that, oh my, I, and I just went like, I, you know, there's a scene there where he comes to school to pick him up, and he's been in trouble, and I'm expecting the movie to go one way, and it goes totally the other, and I'm like. I, Holy I, crap! I think my big disappointment is that they chose for character development. Did you didn't get spider powers? Uh, I I think my disappointment with the movie was that I wanted to be shown the characters, and instead I was told the characters. Uh, they they decided to develop the characters pretty much solely by having people announce who they are and what their intentions are. Whereas I would have I would have vastly preferred to agonize uh, seeing uh, seeing uh, Kirk Connors deal with the day to day. Uh, troubles of having only one arm and seeing him deal with things and uh, in, in to where I would empathize with him. That would make me really wrap my mind around it. But instead, to have him walk up, up, you know, his first appearances in front of a tour group and saying, I'm Kirk Connors, I'm a Southpaw, which, may, which is essentially saying, I only have one arm. Can you guess what my motivation is? Uh, that that was, dis it was, just, it was just disappointing for me. I felt like there was a much more nuanced way and much more engaging way they could have sold me on the characters. And the characters eventually felt totally empty and that's why the movie felt empty to me yeah i mean yeah, if i may I, defend I that the point of that though was he was trying to make light of the fact that he's over this and it doesn't affect him but you realize how deeply down he is bothered by it he starts off with a joke and you realize it's a hollow joke that was the story of connor if, you realize if his that's life. the case then you should have a scene that explains that to me you well know? you don't be but the, you're just the guy that says you don't want his spoon fed if you look at the evolution of his arc that's what becomes very apparent where his motivations go to well all right let me let me just make one final completely bomb throwing point. <laughs> sure. Um, I personally find to take your analogy, Brian, about the pill you have to swallow in the comic book movie. I find Spider-Man's origin of Oscorp being a leading science and research, uh, you know, dealing with cutting with a multi multi focused pouring a bunch of money into a bunch of different areas and trying to break new grounds and stuff that he is infected in, in whatever way and becomes Spider-Man. I find that origin less of a pill to swallow than the billionaire orphan that learns to become a ninja after escaping from a foreign prison. Really? Yes. Huh? All right. I mean, uh, I I don't know really how to how to respond to that outside of uh, uh, 
the the problem is that those two descriptions completely take out the storytelling that goes into them. And what I loved yes, about Batman do. Begins was that it gave a context, it gave a character flaw that needed to be overcome, it gave a reason for the self-destructive habits that eventually led him into this dark place, and it gave him a uh, a, a reason for wanting to to of himself develop these talents that eventually make him Batman. Whereas uh, that to me is far more compelling and interesting and believable than. I don't know. He ran it in, wandered into the wrong room. I guess a radioactive spider bit him. And this is coming from a guy who is diehard Marvel comics to the bone and hates DC. Like I, of those two movies, Batman began at least three times better than the amazing Spider-Man. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I quantify it. I think, I think it is a better film. I mean, but that's only because I, I just adore Batman begins. Like I, I'm just saying in terms of the, the pill to swallow. And I'll, I'll say this. I believe that Avengers was amazing. I thought that Spider-Man, to me personally, was a better film than The Avengers. And I hope very dearly that come the 20th, the best comic book movie of the summer and the best comic book movie ever will be unspooled before my eyes. Oh, and there's, there's no according way. to, did you read those, uh, the, the, the reports of the first critic screening? No. Standing ovation. I, oh, okay. Well, look, people give me a standing ovation. So what the hell no. does that mean? But like, I don't know. I feel like there's like you know, people I'll tell are you saying what, when that the like director you know, if, himself, if, if it's ever if there's ever going to be a comic book best picture, that that this is it. Like a best picture buzz is already beginning, and I feel like people kind of want to take a crap on this movie in a little. Uh, a little I bit. hope it's good. I hope I'm blown away. I'm deeply troubled by the fact that the director of the film made a point in interviews of reminding people that there are no great third films in trilogies. That that is highly highly disturbing. To I me. didn't read that. Where was that? Yeah, no, he talks about that. He says, think about it. What 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 great third movie is there? He talked because he was talking about Last how you say he he talked about uh, it's not the best of the three, not by a long shot. It, it was adorable and it was over the top. Wait, what did you say, Justin? He said Last Last Crusade. Last Crusade. Uh, yes. And and so keep in mind also, uh, plus that coupled with the fact that well, the right, marketing... no, you said great, not best. Okay. All right. Well, uh, yeah, no, it was, it was a very good, very good third film. Uh, I, if I, if you're going to list the great movies, you would certainly list, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and a bunch of other movies before you would, you would be out of the top 10 before you brought up Indiana Jones, the last crusade. All I'm saying is I want it okay. to be good. I'm highly skeptical from what I've seen that it will be as good as the previous two. All right. Well, I guess there we go. That's something we can leave it on. Yeah, I have, I have, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm open for it to be great. I have all of my fears that go into watching it, but uh, I think Christopher Nolan is the finest working director today. Absolutely. So. He definitely is. So. Anyhow, boys and girls, it's a, a, a contentious episode of Weird Things as we discover, you know, our, our, our deep rooted uh, feelings about some of these issues and come to, come to verbal blows. Spider-Man's uh, my boyfriend. What a, what a, uh, I mean, what a, what an embarrassment of riches we have, though, that we get to sit here and argue over, well, about how, which was better, Avengers, Spider-Man, or should we be too expectation about Dark Knight Rises? And I mean, just remember that cold, dark period, you know, where, you know, we'd like, oh, coming up, uh, Al Kilmer's going to be, a, or Clooney's <laughs> going to be in a Batman movie, and, uh. Yay. <laughs> so, uh, it's been weird. Yeah. Got this saved. I, I love, I'm, I'm sorry. I love, I love the amount of passion we can bring to this. This is, this is, this is, this is great. It's pretty dorky. <laughs> it is. And that's what makes it fun is that people out there feel, you know, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to be like, you know, Brian's absolutely right. These guys are idiots. They drink the Kool-Aid or agree with us or whatever. Or they're just going to look at us and go, man, I'm glad I have a functioning life. <laughs> if, if, if I could have gone back and focused on anything different, it would have been on singing the praises of how good Spider-Man 2 was. Spider-Man 2 Maybe really, one of the three best comic book movies of all time, and I just don't even see the Amazing Spider-Man as in the same league as that one. Yeah, that's where we're different. I mean, yeah, I mean, and I love too, and I would agree. Pre Amazing Spider-Man, I would I would challenge anybody, you know, that Spider-Man Two isn't at least in your top five for comic book movies. I mean, I think it was it was it was awesome. I love Spider-Man Two, but I think it is kind of unfair to compare 
you know, to compare that movie to the amazing Spider-Man. I mean, you can, obviously they're both films and they both tell stories, but like the Spider-Man two has the benefit of not having to introduce its, its characters in the same but, way but, that but the amazing Spider-Man had the benefit of that. Is there any living American who didn't know the Spider-Man origin story? They well, could have, they could have done the origin amazing story. Spider-Man. They and could, not, not to of, where he wants to go with these characters. They, they could have, they could have done the amazing Spider-Man uh, just started it with him started it with him being a raid uh, doing Spider-Man crap and then tell their own crazy different story. There was no reason that they had to do the origin. Well, because I think I, I would say, I would to. say that's different because this is a different Spider-Man. This is a different Spider-Man than the Raimi Spider-Man. He's he's different capabilities, different outlook. There's a different background to him that we didn't get. And also, remember, Raimi burned through Goblin, part of Hobgoblin. We got Venom. We got Sandman. We got Doc Ock. Yeah, I'm I'm not counting Spider-Man 3. Spider-Man 3 never happened. Still, it happened, Brian. No, it no, I'm afraid it, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't. Well, or, or, I, I, I wonder how much of that colors it for you guys that that uh, Spider-Man three. Do you feel like it corrupted or polluted your experience with Spider-Man one and two? No, not no, really. I, I, I was I was not that high on one when it came out. I mean, I really I I was I, one had a lot of flaws and I and I was kind of like, ah, I liked it, but I, I thought it was had an overly long first act. I did not, I was very, I was, and I defended Raimi going into it. Like people are like, oh, why is he doing organic web shooters? I'm like, let him tell the story. And then I go, man, he did that for dumb reasons after the fact. And then, you know, because of how he saw Peter Parker, not because I cared if they're mechanical or organic. I just cared about how he saw that character. And so that was frustrating. And the two, I, I too, I like, but two is definitely not in my top five uh, comic book movies. Oh my God. It's one of the few comic book movies where they had the patience. You had an established character and they took a full movie with no additional villains whatsoever. How many second comic book movies have ever done that where they gave the spotlight to a fascinating character where you understood his motivations and part of you almost was rooting for him. It was like nothing I'd seen as far as, as far as comic book movies. Go. Dark Knight. Dark Knight had two bad guys. Exactly. Dark Dark Knight fell in the same trap that all the other movies do. That's why it sucked, Justin. Uh, well, dude, I will flat out say, and I will defend till I die, that Batman Begins was superior to the Dark Knight, uh, the first Dark Knight movie. Well, we should have got that on the record so everybody could hear you say that. No, we've no me and Brian. I know me and Brian have yelled about this before. No, we. I think we probably have yelled this. about this on this podcast as well. Probably. Uh. I mean, but no, I think the, the takeaway is like we have comic book movies as art now, no matter what we, you know, they're not schlock. Like you can say that they are misfires. You can say that they are, are boring, but I don't know if you can say that they are not trying to do things that we either agree or do not agree with. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's an amazing that's an amazing place, I think. I'm a, it's a, it makes me a very happy boy. Also, I, I again, I I am, and, and we are, I mean, we are in, in such a great place where you know three of us can sit here and Brian can pick it apart, knowing there's a lot of great material out there that he can say, well, I like this better, I like this better, rather than we have to pick these movies apart in a vacuum. There, there's enough great comic book movies out there. Did I freeze? Is that <laughs> is that Andrew's yodel hole? <laughs> no, he's back. Um, okay, but legitimately, and the show's over, and I'm no longer recording. In fact, I'm upgrade. I'm uploading it here. I'll even show you. I'm uploading it to the website right now um, to prove it to us. <laughs> seriously, you how think, do we know that wasn't a pre-record? You, you think you think the lizard man was was an interesting? Why bit? do you are you know that you're start you're trying you're trying to pick pick a fight with the lizard man thing, and you said it three times during the thing. It's the lizard. You goddamn well know it's the lizard. Well, but that's just, but but okay. They made Doctor Octopus a guy who was like, I got arms," and they made him fascinating. And I wanted so much to learn more. I could watch a whole movie just from Doc Ock's pr perspective. The well, Lizard Man was Man utterly two, boring. Spider Man Two was largely about Doc Ock, though. The amount of screen time spent with Doc Ock was much greater than the amount of screen time spent with Doc Connors. Sure. Um, and, yeah, and, that's why I felt there was there was a lot of. Uh, similarities to the scarecrow to uh ichabod crane but but i guess or, or i guess that the thing about the scarecrow is that i actually i did feel like i understood him and his motivations i understood uh that that he was ambitious and he wanted to do what it takes to get ahead and he had this talent and this uh, 
maybe he was one dimensional, but I at least got him and, and I could wrap my mind and I could put myself in his body and do all the things he's doing. I couldn't do that with, with, with the lizard man. The lizard man was like, even if I, I, all right, hold on. Can we pause it? And so you, but you are, you're using the lizard man thing. Like just to, just to pick. What do you mean to pick? It's, it's well, there are two the personalities you know, there. That, that would be, that would be like me saying, like if I'm trying to, to say I hate uh, the the second Spider-Man movie, calling him Doctor Octopus Metally Arms Guy. <laughs> well, his name is the Lizard Man. That's no, the it's the Lizard. No, it's Lizard Man. Hold on, Lizard Man coming next week. <laughs> Hold on, Spider-Man. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Google. Hold on, there we go. I'm going to the goods. Go to now you realize that I am, I am horrifyingly gun shy after last week's NSFW show. About what? I feel like I shouldn't talk about anything. Man, lizard, man. And in in the comic books, he is called the lizard, Brian. All right. Um. Oh, what's the first link? Oh, it's lizard. Click on lizard man. Click on the first link there. Lizard man. Oh wait, it just says lizard. Oh well. So you got me, sir. How's it feel <laughs> to be on top of Pretty me? Pretty awesome. Excuse me, I'm going to do a little dance around my room. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, I mean, I, no, I, 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 uh, my, my me, point let, wasn't let, whether let, or not me, that uh, was uh, the right I, thing. I, hold that. on, no, this, you're right. This is important. Uh, I apologize <laughs> yes. to all of the On lizards. your knees, Brian. I apologize. These things matter. I apologize to everyone who has scales, who has been inappropriately called a lizard man. You are lizards. I have eczema, Brian. That's not From very this funny. Day forward, let let the lizards run free. I say. I, I apologize. I have run cortisone on my body. You are not lizard men. You are just lizards, and I apologize for. Well, for I mean, the character's <laughs> called the lizard. That's the name of the character. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what, what's funny is that uh, I did not realize that you thought I was intentionally doing this uh, this hokey don't remember the name of the character thing. Yes, that's what I thought you were doing. And so my point isn't whether or not you got it wrong or not. My no. point is that that's what I thought you were doing. Because no, I, 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 I thought was... that you knew that the name of the character was the lizard. And you're like, oh, because you hated the character that you were like, oh, the lizard man's running no. up and down the buildings. Uh, the problem is, is like uh, the only time and let's face it until now, the only the if you went back, the only times you would see outside of the comic, the lizard would have been in the, uh, you know, the 1967 comic uh or cartoon spider-man and spider-man and his amazing friends and maybe if i had watched it the 1990s version but like where else would you have seen them uh my cards what's that like the like the binders and binders of which i have still have at my mom's house of what comic cards oh dude. Comic i cards. actually found i actually brother. i found a bunch of my comic cards i gave a bunch of them to my little brother uh my six-year-old little brother not my biological little brother uh and he, I, I, I gave him like the riot act. I'm like, listen, these are sacred. You read them, and then you memorize them, and, and you, and you put them back. Uh, yeah. Um, how do you, how, what are your feelings on a sequel, Brian? On this, I don't even care. I mean, <laughs> I, I, and I mean that sincerely. I want to care. Nothing no, in I me. I sincerely. Don't care. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'm saying you took that as the exact opposite of what I meant it as. What, what I mean this as is uh, I want very much to care, and I want very much for this to be something that is exciting to me. But, but I'm sad. I'm genuinely sad that I'm left just, just shrugging my shoulders. It's like, I don't know. If you're going to reboot something. Like, if I had to choose right now between a sequel to The Amazing Spider-Man and a reboot of the Fantastic Four franchise, Fantastic Four without a doubt. If I had to see uh, any other property, I would I would have. I I just I just I want all of them. What what did I get besides uh, what did I get that was new besides a, a a dour, less likable Peter Parker? He was so much less likable. He was so much less interesting. Well, I I find him way more identified. Well, I, yeah, I, I I was I was watching this going, man. If he didn't put on the mask till the end of the movie, I would be happy. I was so much enjoying. The 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 figuring out, you know, and the right, the Gwen Stacy stuff and all that where I was I was so 
I could have watched those guys on a date. You know, I could have watched them, the high school romance kind Dude, of thing. I, well, like I said, that was their strength. And that was that was truly charming and it was truly magical. But like uh, just I mean, even, you know, Flash Thompson was one dimensional. Uh, oh, you, he he changed, one dimensional. Brian, you used this term. There was a whole arc for Flash. Sure. Insofar as an well, he's arc. the first one who wants to console him about his uncle dying after he humiliates him. I mean, did on the you like? Did court? you like him at that point? Because in the comic book, no. Flash had his own demons. Flash was a guy. Flash in the comics was a guy that has a very fascinating career. And here we got this where he went from being this bully. He gets humiliated by Parker. Parker, and when ben, when Uncle Ben dies, Flash goes up to him to console him, and he realizes that Parker's not just a thug going around there. Flash is dealing with his own stuff. And was sympathetic to Parker, which you know he changed. I mean, that's not that's a, that's the exact opposite of one dimensional. When a small character like that has that big, you know, one eighty, well, you, you get four scenes with him. You get him picking on the kid at the beginning when right. he's a total asshole. Right. You get him getting put in his place by Parker. Right. Uh, you know, and that's him humiliated. You get him uh, being the only person to walk up out of a, a pile of strangers to talk to Parker about the fact that his uncle died and Parker reacting to him the way he does. And then you get him at the end wearing the Spider-Man shirt and, and you know. Right, and by the numbers, representation. by the numbers, all of this is stuff I should love. Why didn't I feel it during the movie? I mean, whose fault is that? Two is out that... of three people here did. <laughs> uh, well, what's funny is I was about to ask sarcastically is like, is that a flaw of me? And then that's exactly what you just fucking said. <laughs> so I guess, I'm, I guess, I mean, your position apparently is like, I'm again, broken and retarded. The... So I guess that's the end of it. No, I mean, and just being a like, I mean, uh, no, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I genuinely, I, I, I am disappointed that you didn't like it because I do. Uh, I, 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 it was one of those movies that I very much kind of felt a a a kinship with and i really loved it i want to go see it again uh, i'll just say this and i wish i would have said it during the podcast it was the only time i've walked out of a 3d movie an imax 3d movie that i was not like fuck imax 3d okay well you know what maybe that's part of the problem but because i was i was so fucking angry when the last scene of the movie was pew over here pew over there and then Jizz in your face, 3D. Oh, uh, yeah. See, like I didn't, I didn't, I made sure not to see it first in 3D because 3D is an abomination. Okay. Yeah. I went and saw it. And not the abomination saw... who is the villain in Hulk. Not abomination, <laughs> <Yes>. man. <laughs> abomination, I saw it in 2D man. first. I went out of my way to go see it in 2D first. Like uh, that gratuitous, obviously shot for 3D moment was. Just sort of like 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 everyone in the theater I was at laughed out loud at that moment because oh, yeah. they all because they all knew what that was, and it's like that that doesn't happen at movies that people love. In my experience, well, well Brian, are we gonna go? I mean, when we start going outside of our expectations, then we pull in the Rotten Tomatoes and the IMDb on it. I don't know what that means. And so maybe it's just people in your theater in Austin. Well, no, I think that, listen, it was, it, it was, I mean, in terms of a, a, a facial situation, there's, there's a funny joke to be made there. And I mean, the fact that it's, he shoots the web, the fucking director's name is Mark Webb. Like, you know, there's, there's all these, it's a very cutesy moment that is obviously put there for 3d. Uh, I'll say this, uh, the movie's usage of 3d is the best I've seen since avatar. There certainly is a heightened experience to the aerial kind of scenes. I saw it first in 2D and then last night I saw it in, in 3D and I definitely enjoyed elements of it more. But I mean, like, yeah, that last part is obviously like, you know, uh, it's him going through the uh, the construction equipment and that's a, that's a big kind of 3D moment. Feeling the speed of the swinging throughout the movie, but particularly in that scene is a big part of the 3D element. And it's put there for a reason. It's, it's, it's fine. It's put there at the end of the the end of the movie our stories our story ends with uh gwen stacy and him in the drama class yeah and then the captain america the 3d things. shield thing it's like and i love that movie but wait uh, the what captain america the 3d shield you know oh Let's i i, see, I only saw i only saw it in 2d and i don't remember 
uh, I never noticed that moment, so it's difficult for it me. It was to... a lot of really dumb moments. Yeah. In, no, in like, I, that, I, that I go, I always go see movies first in two D because I, again, I, I three D forces, you know, forces so many choices that interfere with the story. I don't, I don't, I'll see three, like I'll go see Spider Man in three D now because I'm not worried about, you know. I'll tell you. Spider-Man did the same stupid thing that Prometheus did, though, in the early parts of the 3D where there's no action to be had that can have any kind of dynamic 3D thing. They just randomly put in Prometheus when they're walking through the cave. They just had half the cave like right in your face with like the, the 3D. And in Spider-Man, when he's uh, looking in the flooded out basement to find the uh, the attache case, his father's attache case, right. they have... The, the the step stool or whatever like it's looking through the wooden right. steps and the wooden steps are like right in your face and it's like well thank god we had 3d so my vision could be obstructed more efficiently <laughs> by a physical object. that's that's, that's what i love about nolan is that nolan's you know at that point where he can be like no no i'll shoot at widescreen imax but no we're not getting 3d you know and he and he's like oh did you do batman begins in, in dark knight did you no you oh you didn't direct that um sorry no 3d right right all right, gentlemen. Well, hey, I got to bug out, but uh, it was a good discussion as always. I will chat with I, you guys. I thoroughly enjoy this discussion, Brian. And I think it was much more interesting that we had divergent opinions. Uh, yes, uh, we did have divergent opinions. <laughs> <laughs> 